Hi, welcome to my channel, Listen Sense, where I like to share with you creative writings like poetry and published stories. If you are returning, welcome back. It is so nice to have you. Today's intro is going to be a longer one since I have some things I'd like to get off of my chest as it relates to the central feeling of this video. I'm going to put in a time to jump to if this is something you'd like to skip. So to just jump right in, I am at a time in my life where I am experiencing grief for the first time and experiencing it deeply. I mentioned in past videos that I like to try and post on every Wednesday and Saturday and then I dropped off of that schedule, which I definitely apologize for. The reason I started this channel was to create content that I'd like to see more of, and I wanted to do it right and be as professional and efficient as possible to try and not only make this my new way uh, to make a living like so many others, but create content that doesn't follow the clickbait or pop culture regulator type of videos that we see more frequently. All of my work started a bit before COVID hit while I was still working full time with the idea to make a sort of ASMR or easy listening channel where I could recite poetry for people like me who want to spend more time with literature and like to have more access to it. I was starting entirely from scratch with no college degree, no social media influence, no idea the kind of research I needed to put in, no knowledge of video editing or audio editing or content creation at all, and I quickly realized I was in over my head a ton. But slowly in my free time, I learned how to navigate the editing software and create a clear picture of what I wanted to create. I was well into the groove of trying to make a lot of content ahead of time to periodically release while I figured out a schedule that worked for me on top of working full time. I was hit with the death of someone very close to me and just like that, I was experiencing grief for the first time well into my young adult life. It truly does feel like dying with them. I don't want to just start dumping on here, but I was not free of mental health challenges before this happened, but having this full body sadness always just around the corner at all times definitely took some adjusting to. Now that I'm typing all this out, I don't think I've spoken this honestly about how it feels. It took me years to build up the courage and find the energy to invest time and diligence into creating this content. And just like that, it felt like nothing mattered anymore. I left my job once this happened because I fully worked through the pandemic and decided that one, I deserve time off after working full time for years straight out of high school. And two, I was not in a good headspace to be working in something as mentally and emotionally taxing as customer service. As some of you may know, it's not just the customers that make the job difficult. So again, slowly, here we are. I was able to force myself to upload what I have so I could finally start. And I thought it would start a fire in me to keep going, like add bad pressure that could lead to something good happening, but I don't operate sustainably or happily under bad pressure. <sighs> so I kept putting it off until now, in March, where I'm sitting here typing out all of my thoughts. I'd like to talk now about how the way I personally consumed content and the content I would consume changed drastically to be able to express a little deeper the idea behind my videos. Before life changed with COVID, my attention span never used to allow me to watch YouTube videos for very long, and videos I did watch were highly edited, two times speed, 
and very formulaic in nature. They were very attention-grabbing ones. And when it came to listening to music, I made sure to save so many songs so I never heard the same ones too frequently. Fast forward to over a year ago, I found myself choosing to listen to the same song on repeat for days and preferring long-form content like deep dives and video essays or anything really, as long as the video was 30 minutes or more. Usually these videos were centered around things like true crime or people's get ready with me's or reviewing things I knew I had no interest in. Currently, I've stumbled upon anti-MLM content, like multi-level marketing. I've become pretty addicted. I think my daily screen time averages somewhere around eight hours now, because if I'm cooking, folding my clothes, doing chores, braiding my hair, practicing my typing, running, doing just about anything, my phone is playing something during it. I'm pretty sure the fact that COVID brought along social distancing and sheltering in place, which is very necessary, my mind started to try and create the only kind of social interaction that was safe and interesting to me, which is long-form content in order to stave off loneliness. So, as for my videos, I like the videos to be long, for people like me who like to have things playing in the background. I read poetry because I've always loved poetry and reading books, but with my challenging attention span, I can read a murder mystery book no problem, but struggle to focus on things that require deeper analysis and challenging my brain because there's no immediate reward there. So now I get to surround myself with prose and writing and maybe encourage discussion on more emotional and perspective matters. Then we have the visual I create for each video, which serves to be kind of relaxing, but not too distracting. So you don't have to feel like you're missing anything if you're someone like me and like to have something playing in the background while you do other work. And I will remain faceless on this channel Due to the fact that I am reading someone else's words, so I want the connection from the audience to be made to them, not me, just to ensure that they get the recognition they deserve, almost like I'm the page that they wrote the words on. And lastly, I repeat each piece twice so that we can really honor the author and try to understand what they were feeling and saying because... That is one of the most caring things you can do for someone who creates works like these for people to see and hear and read. That was a lot. (laughs) And if you're still here, thank you for hearing me out. I'm going to try and post on the schedule of every Wednesday and every other Saturday. I'm at the point where editing nine minutes of audio takes me about 40 minutes. I'm getting better at keyboarding, so I type at a medium speed when I make my own transcription. And since I have always had a very quiet, hard-to-hear voice, it tends to break a lot. And I need breaks a lot for vocal strain when it comes to recording the audio. I will also be posting TikToks of me making the floating pieces I use while I recite poems you'll see in these videos. If you're curious about that or just would like to support me, feel free to follow me on TikTok at ListenSense. Let's continue to the pieces I'm going to present in this video. They all follow the theme of how it feels to lose someone and the many feelings that come after of missing them and feeling wronged and the stages of grief and keeping their memory alive. You'll notice that the bird I created for the visual will start to sink in the water, which isn't what I intended, and usually I would try to fix that, but it's sinking under the water and out of reach felt right for this video. We will start with Billy's Rose by George Robert Sims, written sometime between 1847 to 1922 which is Robert Sims' lifetime. 
it's a long one, it's more of a story, and I hope you enjoy. Billy's dead and gone to glory, so has Billy's sister now. There's a tale I know about them where I poet I would tell. Soft it comes, with perfume laden like a breath of country air. Wafted down that filthy alley bringing fragrant odors there. In that vile and filthy alley long ago, one winter's day, Dying quick of want and fever, hapless, patient Billy lay, while beside him sat his sister, in the garret's dismal gloom, cheering with her gentle presence, Billy's pathway to the tomb. Many a tale of elf and fairy did she tell the dying child, till his eyes lost half their anguish and his worn, wan features smiled. Tales herself she heard haphazard, caught amid the babble roar, lisped about by tiny gossips playing round their mother's door. Then she felt his wasted fingers tighten feebly as she told how beyond this dismal alley lay a land of shining gold. Where when all the pain was over, when all the tears were shed, he would be a white-frocked angel with a gold thing on his head. Then she told some garbled story of a kind-eyed savior's love, how he built for little children great big playgrounds up above, where they sang and played at hopscotch and at horses all the day, and where the beetles or policemen never frightened them away. This was Nell's idea of heaven, just a bit of what she'd heard, with a little bit invented, with a little bit inferred. But her brother lay and listened and seemed to understand, for he closed his eyes and murmured he could see the promised land. Yes, he whispered, I can see it, Sister Nell. Oh, the children look so happy, they are all so strong and well. I can see them there with Jesus, he is playing with them too. Let us run away and join them if there's room for me and you. She was eight, this little maiden, and her life had all been spent in the garret and the alley where they starved to pay the rent, when a drunken father's curses and a drunken mother's blows drove her forth into the gutter from the day's dawn to its close. But she knew enough, this outcast, just to tell the sinking boy, you must die before you are able all the blessings to enjoy. You must die, she whispered, Billy, I am not even ill, but I will come to you, dear brother. Yes, I promise that I will. You are dying, little brother. You are dying, oh, so fast. I heard father say to mother that he knew you wouldn't last. Then they will put you in a coffin. Then you'll wake and be up there. While well, I am left alone to suffer in the garret, bleak and bare. Yes, I know it, answered Billy. Ah, sister, I do not mind. Gentle Jesus will not beat me. He's not cruel or unkind. But I can't help thinking, Nellie, I should like to take away. Something, sister, that you gave me I might look at every day. In the summer, you remember how the mission took us out to the great green, lovely meadow where we played and ran about, and the van that took us halted by a bright green patch of land where the fine red blossoms grew dear, half as big as mother's hand. Nell, I asked the good kind teacher what they called such flowers as those. And I remember that he told me that the pretty name was Rose. 
I have never seen them since, dear. How I wish I had one. Just to keep and think of you, dear, when I am up beyond the sun. Not a word spoke little Nelly, but at night when Billy slept, on she flung her scanty garments, and then down the stairs she crept. Through the silent streets of London, running nimbly as a fawn, running on and running ever till the night had changed to dawn. When the foggy sun had risen and the mist had cleared away, all around her wrapped in snowdrift, there the open country lay. She was tired, her limbs were frozen, and the roads had cut her feet, but there came no flowery gardens for her poor tearful eyes to greet. She had found the road by asking, she had learnt the way to go. She had found the cruel meadow, it was wrapped in cruel snow. Not a buttercup or daisy, not a single verdant blade, showed its head above its prison. Then she knelt her down and prayed, with her eyes upcast to heaven. Down she sank upon the ground and she prayed to God to tell her where the roses might be found. Then the cold blast numbed her senses, and her sight grew strangely dim, and a sudden awful tremor seemed to seize her every limb. Oh, Rose, she moaned, good Jesus, just a rose to take to Bill. And as she prayed, a chariot came thundering down the hill. A lady sat there, toying with a red rose rare and sweet. As she passed, she flung it from her, and it fell at Nellie's feet. Just a word her lord had spoken caused her ladyship to fret, and the rose had been his present, so she flung it in a pet. But the poor half-blinded Nellie thought it had fallen from the skies. And she murmured, thank you, Jesus, as she clasped the dainty prize. Lo, that night, from out the alley, did a child's soul pass away, from dirt and sin and misery to where God's children play. Lo, that night, a wild, fierce snowstorm burst in fury o'er the land, and at morn they found Nell frozen with the red rose in her hand. Billy's dead and gone to glory, so has Billy's sister now. Am I bold to say this happened in the land where angels dwell, that the children met in heaven after all their earthly woes, and that Nellie kissed her brother and said, Billy, here's your rose. Billy's dead and gone to glory. So has Billy's sister now. There's a tale I know about them where I poet I would tell. Soft it comes, with perfume laden like a breath of country air. Wafted down that filthy alley bringing fragrant odors there. In that vile and filthy alley long ago, one winter's day, dying quick of want and fever, Hapless, patient Billy lay, while beside him sat his sister, in the garret's dismal gloom, cheering with her gentle presence Billy's pathway to the tomb. Many a tale of elf and fairy did she tell the dying child, till his eyes lost half their anguish, and his worn, wan features smiled. Tales herself she heard haphazard, caught amid the babel roar, lisped about by tiny gossips playing round their mother's door. Then she felt his wasted fingers tighten feebly as she told how beyond this dismal alley lay a land of shining gold, where when all the pain was over, when all the tears were shed, he would be a white-frocked angel with a gold thing on his head. Then she told some garbled story of a kind-eyed savior's love, how he built for little children 
great big playgrounds up above where they sang and played at hopscotch and at horses all the day and where the beetles or policemen never frightened them away. This was Nell's idea of heaven, just a bit of what she'd heard, with a little bit invented, with a little bit inferred. But her brother lay and listened and seemed to understand, for he closed his eyes and murmured he could see the promised land. Yes, he whispered, I can see it, Sister Nell. Oh, the children look so happy, they are all so strong and well. I can see them there with Jesus, he is playing with them too. Let us run away and join them if there's room for me and you. She was eight, this little maiden, and her life had all been spent in the garret and the alley where they starved to pay the rent. When a drunken father's curses and a drunken mother's blows drove her forth into the gutter from the day's dawn to its close. But she knew enough, this outcast, just to tell the sinking boy, you must die before you are able all the blessings to enjoy. You must die, she whispered, Billy, I am not even ill. But I will come to you, dear brother. Yes, I promise that I will. You are dying, little brother. You are dying, oh, so fast. I heard father say to mother that he knew you wouldn't last. Then they will put you in a coffin. Then you'll wake and be up there. While I am left alone to suffer in the garret, bleak and bare. Yes, I know it, answered Billy. Ah, sister, I do not mind. Gentle Jesus will not beat me. He's not cruel or unkind. But I can't help thinking, Nellie, I should like to take away. Something, sister, that you gave me I might look at every day. In the summer, you remember how the mission took us out? To the great green lovely meadow where we played and ran about, and the van that took us halted by a bright green patch of land, where the fine red blossoms grew dear half as big as mother's hand. Nell, I asked the good kind teacher what they called such flowers as those, and I remember that he told me that the pretty name was Rose. I have never seen them since, dear. How I wish I had one. Just to keep and think of you, dear, when I am up beyond the sun. Not a word spoke little Nellie, but at night when Billy slept, on she flung her scanty garments, and then down the stairs she crept. Through the silent streets of London, running nimbly as a fawn, running on and running ever till the night had changed to dawn when the foggy sun had risen and the mist had cleared away all around her wrapped in snowdrift there the open country lay she was tired her limbs were frozen and the roads had cut her feet but there came no flowery gardens for her poor tearful eyes to greet she had found the road by asking she had learnt the way to go. She had found the cruel meadow, it was wrapped in cruel snow. Not a buttercup or daisy, not a single verdant blade, showed its head above its prison. Then she knelt her down and prayed, with her eyes upcast to heaven. Down she sank upon the ground and she prayed to God to tell her where the roses might be found. Then the cold blast numbed her senses, and her sight grew strangely dim, and a sudden awful tremor seemed to seize her every limb. Oh, Rose, she moaned, good Jesus, just a rose to take to Bill. And as she prayed, a chariot came thundering down the hill. A lady sat there toying with a red rose rare and sweet, 
As she passed, she flung it from her, and it fell at Nellie's feet. Just a word her lord had spoken caused her ladyship to fret, and the rose had been his present, so she flung it in a pet. But the poor half-blinded Nellie thought it had fallen from the skies. And she murmured, Thank you, Jesus, as she clasped the dainty prize. Lo, that night, from out the alley, did a child's soul pass away, from dirt and sin and misery to where God's children play. Lo, that night, a wild, fierce snowstorm burst in fury o'er the land, and at morn they found Nell frozen with the red rose in her hand. Billy's dead and gone to glory, so has Billy's sister, Nell. Am I bold to say this happened in the land where angels dwell, that the children met in heaven after all their earthly woes, and that Nellie kissed her brother and said, Billy, here's your rose. And this piece is called Epitaph for a Darling Lady by Dorothy Parker, written sometime between her lifetime of 1893 to 1967. All her hours were yellow sands, blown in foolish whirls and tassels, slipping warmly through her hands, padded into little castles. Shiny day on shiny day, tumble in a rainbow clutter, as she flipped them all away, sent them spinning down the gutter. Leave for her a red young rose. Go your way and save your pity. She is happy, for she knows that her dust is very pretty. All her hours were yellow sands, blown in foolish whirls and tassels, slipping warmly through her hands padded into little castles. Shiny day on shiny day, tumble in a rainbow clutter, as she flipped them all away, sent them spinning down the gutter. Leave for her a red young rose. Go your way and save your pity. She is happy, for she knows that her dust is very pretty. And this piece is called Fidelity by William Wordsworth, written sometime between 1770 and 1850 during his lifetime. I hope you enjoy. A barking sound the shepherd hears, a cry as of a dog or fox. He halts and searches with his eyes among the scattered rocks and now at distance can discern a stirring in a break of fern, and instantly a dog is seen glancing through that covert green. The dog is not of mountain breed, its motions too are wild and shy, with something, as the shepherd thinks, unusual in its cry, nor is there any one in sight, all round, in hollow or on height, nor shout nor whistle strikes his ear. What is the creature doing here? It was a cove, a huge recess, that keeps till June, December's snow, a lofty precipice in front, a silent tarn below, far in the bosom of Helvellyn, remote from public road or dwelling, pathway or cultivated land from trace of human foot or hand there sometimes doth a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer the crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony austere thither the rainbow comes the cloud and mists that spread the flying shroud and sunbeams and the sounding blast that, if it could, would hurry past, but that enormous barrier holds it fast. 
not free from boding thoughts. A while the shepherd stood, then makes his way o'er rocks and stones, following the dog as quickly as he may. Not far had gone before he found a human skeleton on the ground. The appalled discoverer with a sigh looks round to learn the history. From those abrupt and perilous rocks the man had fallen, that place of fear. At length upon the shepherd's mind it breaks and all is clear. He instantly recalled the name and who he was and whence he came. Remembered, too, the very day on which the traveler passed this way. But here I wonder for whose sake this lamentable tale I tell. A lasting monument of words this wonder merits well. The dog which still was hovering nigh, repeating the same timid cry, this dog had been through three months' space, a dweller in that savage place. Yes, proof was plain that, since the day when this ill-fated traveler died, the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side. How nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling Great above all human estimate. A barking sound the shepherd hears, A cry as of a dog or fox. He halts and searches with his eyes Among the scattered rocks, And now at distance can discern A stirring in a break of fern, And instantly a dog is seen glancing through that covert green. The dog is not of mountain breed. Its motions, too, are wild and shy, with something, as the shepherd thinks, unusual in its cry. Nor is there any one in sight, all round, in hollow or on height. Nor shout, nor whistle strikes his ear, what is the creature doing here? It was a cove, a huge recess, That keeps till June, December's snow, A lofty precipice in front, A silent tarn below, Far in the bosom of Helvellyn, Remote from public road or dwelling, Pathway or cultivated land, From trace of human foot or hand. There sometimes doth a leaping fish Send through the tarn a lonely cheer. The crags repeat the raven's croak In symphony austere. Thither the rainbow comes, the cloud, And mists that spread the flying shroud, And sunbeams and the sounding blast That, if it could, would hurry past but that enormous barrier holds it fast. Not free from boding thoughts, a while the shepherd stood, then makes his way o'er rocks and stones, following the dog as quickly as he may. Not far had gone before he found a human skeleton on the ground. The appalled discoverer with a sigh looks round to learn the history from those abrupt and perilous rocks the man had fallen, that place of fear. At length upon the shepherd's mind it breaks and all is clear. He instantly recalled the name and who he was and whence he came. Remembered, too, the very day on which the traveler passed this way. But here I wonder for whose sake this lamentable tale I tell. A lasting monument of words this wonder merits well. The dog which still was hovering nigh, Repeating the same timid cry, This dog had been through three months' space, A dweller in that savage place. Yes, proof was plain that, since the day When this ill-fated traveler died, the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side. 
How nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate. This piece is called Let Me Go Warm by Luis de Gongora. Let me go warm and merry still, and let the world laugh and it will. Let other muse on earthly things, the fall of thrones, the fate of kings, and those whose fame the world doth fill, while muffins sit enthroned in trays, and orange punch in winter sways the merry scepter of my days and let the world laugh, and it will. He that the royal purple wears, from golden plate and thousand cares, doth swallow as a gilded pill. On feasts like these I turn my back, whilst puddings in my roasting jack, beside the chimney hiss and crack, and let the world laugh, and it will. And when the wintry tempest blows, and January's sleets and snows are spread o'er every vale and hill with one to tell a merry tale o'er roasted nuts and humming ale. I sit and care not for the gale and let the world laugh and it will. Let merchants traverse seas and lands for silver mines and golden sands whilst I beside some shadowy rill, just where its bubbling fountain swells, do sit and gather stones and shells, and hear the tale the blackbird tells, and let the world laugh, and it will. For heroes sake the Grecian lover, the stormy Hellespont swam over, I cross without the fear of ill, the wooden bridge that slow, bestrides the madrigals enchanting sides or barefoot wade through yep's tides and let the world laugh and it will but since the fates so cruel prove that pyramus should die of love and love should gentle thisbe kill my thisbe be an apple tart the sword i plunge into her heart the tooth that bites the crust apart and let the world laugh and it will let me go warm and merry still and let the world laugh and it will let other muse on earthly things the fall of thrones the fate of kings and those whose fame the world doth fill while muffins sit enthroned in trays, and orange punch in winter sways, the merry scepter of my days, and let the world laugh, and it will. He that the royal purple wears, from golden plate and thousand cares, doth swallow as a gilded pill, on feasts like these I turn my back, whilst puddings in my roasting jack, Beside the chimney hiss and crack, and let the world laugh, and it will. And when the wintry tempest blows, and January's sleets and snows are spread o'er every vale and hill, with one to tell a merry tale o'er roasted nuts and humming ale, I sit and care not for the gale, and let the world laugh, and it will. Let merchants traverse seas and lands for silver mines and golden sands, whilst I beside some shadowy rill, just where its bubbling fountain swells, do sit and gather stones and shells and hear the tale the blackbird tells, and let the world laugh, and it will. For heroes sake the Grecian lover, the stormy Hellespont swam over, I cross without the fear of ill, the wooden bridge that slow bestrides, the madrigals enchanting sides, or barefoot wade through yep's tides.
and let the world laugh, and it will. But since the fates so cruel prove that Pyramus should die of love, and love should gentle Thisbe kill, my Thisbe be an apple tart, the sword I plunge into her heart, the tooth that bites the crust apart, and let the world laugh, and it will. This piece is called Friendship by Jean Ingelow, written sometime in her lifetime between 1820 and 1897. This piece is prefaced by saying, On a son portrait of her husband sent by his wife to their friend. And we begin the piece with beautiful eyes and shall i see no more the living thought when it would leap from them and play in all its sweetness neath their lids here was a man familiar with fair heights that poets climb upon his peace the tears and troubles of our race deep inroads made yet life was sweet to him he kept his heart at home who saw his wife might well have thought, God loves this man, he chose a wife for him, the true one. O oh, sweet eyes that seem to live, I know so much of you, tell me the rest. Eyes full of fatherhood and tender care for small young children. Is a message here that you would fain have sent, but had not time? If such there be, I promise, by long love, in perfect friendship, by all trust that comes of understanding, that I will not fail, no, nor delay to find it. Oh, my heart will often pain me as for some strange fault, some grave defect in nature, when I think how I delighted neath those olive trees moved to the music of tideless main while with sore weeping in an island home they laid that much loved head beneath the sod and i did not know and then this piece follows with nine sets of four line stanzas the first one goes I stand on the bridge where we last stood, when young leaves played at their best. The young children called us from yonder wood, and rock doves crooned on the nest. 2. And yet you call, in your gladness call, and I hear your pattering feet. It does not matter, matter at all. You fatherless children, sweet. 3. It does not matter at all to you, young hearts, that pleasure besets. The father sleeps, but the world is new, the child of his love forgets. 4. I, too, it may be, before they drop, the leaves that flicker today. Ere bountiful gleams make ripe the crop, shall pass from my place away. 5. Ere yon gray signet puts on her white, or snow lies soft on the wold, shall shut these eyes on the lovely light, and leave the story untold. 6. Shall I tell it there? Ah, let that be, for the warm pulse beats so high, to love today and breathe and see, tomorrow perhaps to die. 7. Leave it with God, but this I have known, that sorrow is over soon. Some in dark nights, sore weeping alone, forget by full the moon. 8. But if all loved as the few can love, 
this world would seldom be well. And who need wish if he dwells above for a deep, a long death knell? 9. There are four or five who, passing this place, while they live, will name me yet, and when I am gone will think of my face and feel a kind of regret. This piece is prefaced by saying, On a son portrait of her husband, sent by his wife to their friend. And we begin the piece with, Beautiful eyes, and shall I see no more, The living thought when it would leap from them, And play in all its sweetness neath their lids. Here was a man familiar, with fair heights that poets climb upon his peace the tears and troubles of our race deep inroads made yet life was sweet to him he kept his heart at home who saw his wife might well have thought god loves this man he chose a wife for him the true one o oh, sweet eyes that seem to live I know so much of you, tell me the rest. Eyes full of fatherhood and tender care for small, young children. Is a message here that you would fain have sent, but had not time? If such there be, I promise, by long love, in perfect friendship, by all trust that comes of understanding, that I will not fail, no nor delay to find it. Oh, my heart will often pain me as for some strange fault, some grave defect in nature, when I think how I, delighted neath those olive trees, moved to the music of tideless main, while, with sore weeping in an island home, they laid that much-loved head beneath the sod, and I did not know. And then this piece follows with nine sets of four-line stanzas. The first one goes, I stand on the bridge where we last stood, when young leaves played at their best. The young children called us from yonder wood, and rock doves crooned on the nest. Too. And yet you call, in your gladness call, and I hear your pattering feet. It does not matter, matter at all, you fatherless children sweet. 3. It does not matter at all to you, young hearts, that pleasure besets. The father sleeps, but the world is new, the child of his love forgets. 4. I, too, it may be, before they drop, the leaves that flicker today, ere bountiful gleams make ripe the crop, shall pass from my place away. 5. Ere yon gray signet puts on her white, or snow lies soft on the wold, shall shed these eyes on the lovely light and leave the story untold. 6. Shall I tell it there? Ah, let that be, for the warm pulse beats so high to love today and breathe and see, tomorrow perhaps to die. 7. Leave it with God, but this I have known, that sorrow is over soon. Some in dark nights, sore weeping alone, forget by full the moon. <sighs> 8. But if all loved as the few can love, this world would seldom be well. And who need wish if he dwells above for a deep, a long death knell? 9. There are four 
or five who, passing this place, while they live, will name me yet, and when I am gone, will think of my face and feel a kind of regret. This piece is called The Poet by Raymond Garfield Dandridge, written sometime between 1882 and 1930 during his lifetime. The poet sits and dreams and dreams. He scans his verse, he probes his themes, then turns to stretch or stir about, lest, like his thoughts, his strength give out. Then off to bed, for he must rise and cord some wood, or tamp some ties, or break a field of fertile soil, or do some other manual toil. He dare not live by wage of pen, most poorly paid of poor paid men, with shoes o'errun and threadbare clothes, and editors among the foes, who mock his song, deny him bread, then sing his praise when he is dead. The poet sits and dreams and dreams. He scans his verse, he probes his themes, then turns to stretch or stir about, lest, like his thoughts, his strength give out. Then off to bed, for he must rise and cord some wood or tamp some ties or break a field of fertile soil or do some other manual toil. He dare not live by wage of pen, most poorly paid of poor paid men, with shoes o'errun and threadbare clothes, and editors among the foes, who mock his song, deny him bread, then sing his praise when he is dead. And this piece is called Nocturne by Jose Asuncion Silva, translated by Robert Fernandez, written sometime between 1865 and 1896 in his lifetime. A night, a night full of hushings, of the curled wool of perfume, and encanting wing, a night where phantasmagoric glowworms bump in nuptial blackness at our own pace linked together, mute and glittering, as if we could portend ruin, and your hot fibers all slopped and tangled along the path strung with flowers which crosses emptiness. We walked in the disk of silvery water, in tumbling azure splashed and laughed, and your shadow, fine and dripping, in my shadow, which the rays of the moon nailed down on the sad sands of the pathway, our shadows joined and became one, one, one and they became one horn of shadow, and they became one horn of shadow, and they became one horn of shadow. Tonight, here I am, myself, filled with the black cakes of loneliness and your death, separated from you by all, time, tomb, earth, and by the nothing where no voice can reach, Mortally there and silent, along the path I roamed, and the dogs snapping at moonlight rang out at the splendor and the chirping of the frogs. A chill, it was the chill that in the tomb your face and hands sang with, 
Under a starry vibrance of funereal linens, it was the grave's face of pebbles, death's slick. It was the coldness of nothing, and my shadow, frayed by wild silver, walked alone, walked alone, walked alone amid nothings, and your shadow, trim and quick, fine and dripping, as in that luxuriant spring night expiring, as in that night full of hushings, of the curled wool of perfume, and encanting wing, came and creased through mine, came and creased through mine, came and creased through mine, oh the shadows fuse, Oh, the puzzle pieces of the shadows interlocking. Oh, the shadows chew through each other across zodiacs of sorrows and tears. A night, a night full of hushings, of the curled wool of perfume and encanting wing. A night where Phantasmagoric glowworms bump in nuptial blackness at our own pace linked together, mute and glittering, as if we could portend ruin, and your hot fibers all slopped and tangled along the path strung with flowers which crosses emptiness. We walked in the disk of silvery water in tumbling azure splashed and laughed, and your shadow fine and dripping in my shadow, which the rays of the moon nailed down on the sad sands of the pathway, our shadows joined and became one, 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 and they became one horn of shadow, and they became one horn of shadow, and they became one horn of shadow. Tonight, here I am, myself, filled with the black cakes of loneliness and your death, separated from you by all, time, tomb, earth, and by the nothing where no voice can reach, mortally there and silent, Along the path I roamed, and the dogs snapping at moonlight rang out at the splendor and the chirping of the frogs. A chill, it was the chill that in the tomb your face and hands sang with under a starry vibrance of funereal linens. It was the grave's face of pebbles, death's slick. It was the coldness of nothing, and my shadow, frayed by wild silver, walked alone, walked alone, walked alone amid nothings, and your shadow, trim and quick, fine and dripping, as in that luxuriant spring night expiring, as in that night full of hushings, of the curled wool of perfume, and encanting wing, came and creased through mine, came and creased through mine, came and creased through mine, oh the shadows fuse, oh the puzzle pieces of the shadows interlocking, oh the shadows chew through each other across zodiacs of sorrows and tears. And this piece is called The Road to Heaven, also by George Robert Sims. It's another story-like piece. I would just like to touch on the fact that upon first glance, I liked that the main characters of the story were, you know, minorities. This is that they were Arabic, 
but how they described their caretakers and how careless and abusive and neglectful they were it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth because it makes you think like how terrible these people were and kind of villainizing them especially since the author who wrote it was a renowned author who had access to wealth if you get what i'm saying otherwise i do like this story but i would like to mention i didn't like how he handled that particular aspect of it it can come across as kind of racist but he did do the same in the first story with the other kids we don't know what nationalities they are but we just hope that the author didn't also imagine them as some sort of minorities well you know the abuse of neglectful parents it would i don't even know i don't even know I hope you enjoy. How is the boy this morning? Why do you shake your head? Ah, I can see what's happened. There's a screen drawn round the bed. So, poor little Mike is sleeping, the last long sleep of all. I'm sorry, but who could wonder after that dreadful fall? Let me look at him, doctor, poor little London waif. His frail barks out of the tempest and lies in God's harbor safe. It's better he died in the ward here, better a thousand times, than have wandered back to the alley with its squalor and nameless crimes. Too young for the slum, too sully, he's gone to the wonderland to look on the thousand marvels that he scarce could understand. Poor little baby outcast, poor little waif of sin. He has gone, and the pitying angels have carried him in. Don't you know his story? Ah, you weren't here, I believe. When they brought the poor little fellow to the hospital Christmas Eve, it was I who came here with him, it was I who saw him go, over the bridge that evening into the Thames below. T'was a raw cold air that evening, a biting Christmas frost. I was looking about for a collie, a favorite dog I'd lost. Some ragged boys, so they told me, had been seen with one that night in one of the bridge recesses, so I hunted left and right. You know the stone recesses with the long, broad bench of stone. Too many a weary outcast as welcome as monarch's throne. On the fiercest night you may see them as crouched in the dark they lie, like the hunted vermin striving to hide from the hounds and cry. The seats that night were empty, for the morrow was Christmas Day, and even the outcast loafers seemed to have slunk away. They had found a warmer shelter, some casual ward, maybe. They'd managed a morning's labor for the sake of the meat and tea. I fancied the seats were empty, but as I passed along, out of the darkness floated the words of a Christmas song, sung in a childish tremble. T'was a boy's voice hoarse with cold, quavering out the anthem of angels and harps of gold. I stood where the shadows hid me and peered about until I could see two ragged urchins blue with the icy chill. Cuddling close together, crouched on a big stone seat, two little homeless Arabs, waifs of the London street. One was singing the carol when the other with big round eyes. It was Mike who looked up in wonder and said, Jack, when we dies, is that the place as we goes to, that place where you're dressed in white and has golden arps to play on? and it's warm and jolly and bright.
Is that what they mean by heaven? As the mission coves talk about, where the children's always happy and nobody kicks them out. Jack nodded his head, assenting, and I listened and heard the talk of the little Arabs, listened to every word. Jack was a Sunday scholar, so I gathered from what he said, but he sang in the road for a living his father and mother were dead, and he had a drunken granny who turned him into the street. She drank what he earned, and often he hadn't a crust to eat. He told little Mike of heaven in his rough, untutored way. He made it a land of glory where the children sing all day. And Mike, he shivered and listened and told his tale to his friend. How he was starved and beaten, t'was a tale one's heart to rend. He'd a drunken father and mother who sent him out to beg. Though he just got over a fever and was lame with a withered leg, he told how he daren't crawl homeward because he had begged in vain, and his parents' brutal fury haunted his baby brain. I wish I could go to heaven, he cried as he shook with fright. If I thought, as they'd only take me, why I'd go this very night, which is the way to heaven. How did you get there, Jack? Jack climbed on the bridge coping and looked at the water black. That there's one road to Evan, he said as he pointed down, to where the cold Thames water surged muddy and thick and brown. If we were to fall in there, Mike, we'd be dead. And right through there is the place where it's always sunshine and the angels has crowns to wear. Mike rose and looked at the water. He peered in the big, broad stream, perhaps with a childish notion that he might catch the golden gleam. Over the far-off land of glory, he leaned over and cried, If them are the gates of heaven, how I'd like to be inside. He stood but a moment looking. How it happened, I cannot tell. When he seemed to lose his balance, he gave a short, shrill cry and fell. Fell over the narrow coping, and I heard his poor head strike with a thud on the stonework under. Then, splash in the Thames, went Mike. We brought him here that evening for help I had managed to shout. A boat put off from the landing, and they dragged his body out. His forehead was cut and bleeding but a vestige if life was found. When they brought him here, he was senseless, but slowly the child came around. I came here on Christmas morning. The ward was all bright and gay, with mistletoe green and holly in honor of Christmas Day, and the patients had clean white garments, and a few in the room out there had joined in a Christmas service. They were singing a Christmas air. They were singing a Christmas carol when Mike from his stupor woke, and dim on his wandering senses the strange surroundings broke. Half dreamily he remembered the tale he had heard from Jack, the song and the white-robed angels, the warm bright heaven came back. I'm in heaven, he whispered faintly. Yes, Jack must have told me true, and as he looked about him came the kind old surgeon through. Mike gazed at his face a moment and put his hand to his fevered head, then to the kind old doctor. Please, are you God, he said. Poor little Mike, t'was heaven, this hospital ward, to him. A heaven of warmth and comfort till the flickering lamp grew dim. And now he is safe forever, where such as he are blessed. This is the day of scoffers, but who shall say that night, when Mike asked the road to heaven that Jack didn't tell him right? T'was the children's Jesus pointed the way to the kingdom come. For the poor little tired Mike, the waif of a London slum. 
How is the void this morning? Why do you shake your head? Ah, I can see what's happened. There's a screen drawn round the bed. So, poor little Mike is sleeping the last long sleep of all. I'm sorry, but who could wonder after that dreadful fall? Let me look at him, doctor, poor little London waif. His frail barks out of the tempest and lies in God's harbor safe. It's better he died in the ward here, better a thousand times, than have wandered back to the alley with its squalor and nameless crimes. Too young for the slum, too sully, he's gone to the wonderland, to look on the thousand marvels that he scarce could understand. Poor little baby outcast, poor little waif of sin, he has gone and the pitying angels have carried him in. Don't you know his story? Ah, you weren't here, I believe. When they brought the poor little fellow to the hospital Christmas Eve, it was I who came here with him, it was I who saw him go over the bridge that evening into the Thames below. Twas a raw cold air that evening, a biting Christmas frost. I was looking about for a collie, a favorite dog I'd lost. Some ragged boys, so they told me, had been seen with one that night in one of the bridge recesses, so I hunted left and right. You know the stone recesses with the long, broad bench of stone, too many a weary outcast as welcome as monarch's throne. On the fiercest night you may see them, as crouched in the dark they lie, like the hunted vermin striving to hide from the hounds and cry. The seats that night were empty, for the morrow was Christmas Day, and even the outcast loafers seemed to have slunk away. They had found a warmer shelter, some casual ward, maybe. They'd managed a morning's labor for the sake of the meat and tea. I fancied the seats were empty, but as I passed along, out of the darkness floated the words of a Christmas song, sung in a childish tremble. Twas a boy's voice hoarse with cold, quavering out the anthem of angels and harps of gold. I stood where the shadows hid me and peered about until I could see two ragged urchins blue with the icy chill cuddling close together, crouched on a big stone seat, two little homeless Arabs, waifs of the London street. One was singing the carol when the other with big round eyes. It was Mike who looked up in wonder and said, Jack, when we dies, is that the place as we goes to, that place where you're dressed in white and has golden arps to play on? and it's warm and jolly and bright. Is that what they mean by heaven, as the mission coves talk about, where the children's always happy and nobody kicks them out? Jack nodded his head, assenting, and I listened and heard the talk of the little Arabs listen to every word. Jack was a Sunday scholar, so I gathered from what he said but he sang in the road for a living his father and mother were dead. And he had a drunken granny who turned him into the street. She drank what he earned, and often he hadn't a crust to eat. He told little Mike of heaven in his rough, untutored way. He made it a land of glory where the children sing all day. And Mike, he shivered and listened and told his tale to his friend, how he was starved and beaten, t'was a tale one's heart to rend. He'd a drunken father and mother who sent him out to beg. 
though he just got over a fever and was lame with a withered leg. He told how he daren't crawl homeward because he had begged in vain, and his parents' brutal fury haunted his baby brain. I wish I could go to heaven, he cried as he shook with fright. If I thought, as they'd only take me, why I'd go this very night, which is the way to heaven. How did you get there, Jack? Jack climbed on the bridge coping and looked at the water black. That there's one road to Evan, he said as he pointed down, to where the cold Thames water surged muddy and thick and brown. If we were to fall in there, Mike, we'd be dead. And right through there is the place where it's always sunshine and the angels has crowns to wear. Mike rose and looked at the water. He peered in the big broad stream, perhaps with a childish notion that he might catch the golden gleam of the far-off land of glory. He leaned over and cried, If them are the gates of heaven, how I'd like to be inside. He stood but a moment looking. How it happened, I cannot tell. When he seemed to lose his balance, he gave a short, shrill cry and fell. Fell over the narrow coping, and I heard his poor head strike with a thud on the stonework under. Then, splash in the Thames, went Mike. We brought him here that evening for help I had managed to shout. A boat put off from the landing, and they dragged his body out. His forehead was cut and bleeding, but a vestige if life was found. When they brought him here, he was senseless, but slowly the child came around. I came here on Christmas morning. The ward was all bright and gay, with mistletoe green and holly in honor of Christmas Day. And the patients had clean white garments, and a few in the room out there had joined in a Christmas service. They were singing a Christmas air. They were singing a Christmas carol when Mike from his stupor woke, and dim on his wandering senses the strange surroundings broke. Half dreamily he remembered the tale he had heard from Jack, the song and the white-robed angels, the warm, bright heaven came back. I'm in heaven, he whispered faintly. Yes, Jack must have told me true. And as he looked about him came the kind old surgeon through. Mike gazed at his face a moment and put his hand to his fevered head, then to the kind old doctor. Please, are you God, he said. Poor little Mike. Was heaven this hospital ward to him, a heaven of warmth and comfort till the flickering lamp grew dim, and now he is safe forever where such as he are blessed. This is the day of scoffers, but who shall say that night when Mike asked the road to heaven that Jack didn't tell him right? Twas the children's Jesus pointed the way to the kingdom come. For the poor little tired Mike, the waif of a London slum. And lastly, we have Condolence by Dorothy Parker, written sometime within her lifetime, 1893 to 1967. And I hope you enjoy. They hurried here as soon as you had died, their faces damp with haste and sympathy, and pressed my hand in theirs and smoothed my knee, and clicked their tongues and watched me, mournful-eyed. Gently they told me of that other side. You waited there for me, and what ecstatic meeting ours would be. Moved by the lovely tale, they broke and cried. And when I smiled, they told me I was brave. And they rejoiced that I was comforted. And left to tell of all the help they gave. 
But I had smiled to think how you, the dead, so curiously preoccupied and grave, would laugh could you have heard the things they said. They hurried here as soon as you had died, their faces damp with haste and sympathy, and pressed my hand in theirs and smoothed my knee, and clicked their tongues and watched me, mournful-eyed. Gently they told me of that other side you waited there for me, and what ecstatic meeting ours would be. Moved by the lovely tale, they broke and cried. And when I smiled, they told me I was brave, and they rejoiced that I was comforted, and left to tell of all the help they gave. But I had smiled to think how you, the dead, so curiously preoccupied and grave, would laugh could you have heard the things they said. Thank you for tuning in to this video. I hope you'll join me for my next one. Subscribing would help support me immensely, and liking this video would help out a lot. If you can, please comment down below which piece you preferred. Mine was the last piece, condolences. It's the one I relate to the most. Thank you so much for staying until the end. Goodbye for now, and I hope to see you next time.